So this is joint work uh, with uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Marco. So the objectives of this work are the following. So to uh, provide a uh, geometric mechanism for existence of diffusing orbits. And this mechanism uh, is uh, intended to apply to both a priori unstable and uh, a priori stable case, provided the uh, geometric objects and properties are uh, uh, established. And uh, in the a priori unstable case, uh, it's uh, quite well known how uh, one obtains the geometric objects, the skeleton, the geometric skeleton that organizes the dynamics. While in the a priori stable case, um, this is uh, more recent and requires uh, much more work. And when, I'll, when I'm going to refer to this a priori stable case, uh, I'm going to refer to the geometric structures provided by the work of uh, Jean-Pierre Marco. So um, the method that I'm going to uh, use is a geometric method. And uh, it provides a algorithmic construction. So the idea is uh, to use um, both the uh, inner dynamics and the outer dynamics uh, to construct uh, first pseudo orbits that diffuse, and then uh, use a shadowing lemma type of argument that we've seen uh, in the previous talks to show the existence of diffusing orbits. So, uh, so we will use a lot of inner dynamics, which in our case is going to be a twist map. And less of outer dynamics, which is going to be encoded by uh, scattering maps. So uh, when I say uh, less of the outer dynamics, uh, how, how I want to put it, we are going to use actually lots of scattering maps, but they are going to be very localized. So the point is going to be that uh, you, you use the inner dynamics as much as you can, and you cannot advance any further, only at that point you are going to use the outer dynamics. At the end of the day, you are going to use it in many places and repeatedly. And it's not going to be one scattering map, but multiple scattering maps. But uh, you only use it uh, in the very uh, few places, in the very places when you need to overcome obstacles that are created by the inner dynamics. So in a, it's a little bit opposite to the approach in in uh, with uh, the Ayav and Sarah, where essentially you use only the outer dynamics, and we use only mild properties of the inner dynamics, and in particular, you do not need uh, the inner dy dynamics to be a twist map. So this is a quite different type of approach. So. Um, Nevertheless, uh, for this approach, you do not need to use KM tori, or you don't need to use obri mader theory. So you basically, this is an approach a la Birchhoff, in which you use 
Uh, the basic feature of the twist map that you can go from one place to another by taking successive iterations. So, um, so let me uh, give you the uh, context. Uh, in which, uh, so this is, uh, let's say, a theorem by Marco. <coughs> so the assumption is that uh, you have a Hamiltonian system, which is of uh, three degrees of freedom. Um, the unperturbed Hamiltonian is supposed to be uh, positive definite and um, superlinear. Uh, the Hamiltonian is uh, CR, and uh, let me say that R is going to be uh, large enough. And um, you choose, you fix uh, an energy which is uh, bigger than the minimum of the energy level of the uh, unperturbed system. And uh, you also choose a collection of open sets, O1, OM. Uh, let's just say disjoint or uh, small enough. So these are uh, in open sets in the action in the action space that intersect the energy level. So O i intersect um, H inverse of E is not empty for all i. So basically, the picture is the following. So This is uh, the energy level. So this is a uh, compact surface in R3. And uh, the open sets are a bunch of targets that you want to reach. So you give yourself these targets, O1, O2, and so on. So you want to prove that in the perturbed system, so uh, for appropriate choices of the perturbation, there exist uh, trajectories that uh, visit this, these targets in the prescribed order. So uh, then there exists a, a set of perturbation. Let me call it R epsilon 0. And maybe I'm going to say a few words about this set of perturbation. Uh, such that for each f in r epsilon 0, uh, there exists a trajectory uh, theta of t, r of t, such that r of t i is in uh, o i. Or so these are times. So, and this is for all i. OK, so the idea is that uh, there is a trajectory for the perturbed system in the full space. Um, I mean, it's going to be in the energy manifold. So, so this is in h minus of e, such that these trajectories go from one place to another in the prescribed order. So it's a finite sequence of times? So this is a finite sequence of times as we want to reach a finite sequence of targets. So 
this is up to t. Yes. Okay, so uh, what is so this is a uh, set of perturbation that uh, uh, it's so called. So R epsilon zero represents a set of perturbation that uh, is uh, known as the uh, mother uh, cusp residual. So um, I do not want to, to get into too many details about this set of perturbations. So essentially, if you look at uh, uh, the set of perturbation uh, and you normalize this set of perturbations to, uh, by the uh, CR norm, so there are some directions on the sphere that are bad, and you have to eliminate them. And uh, in the other directions that are not bad, you can only go some uh, epsilon zero away from from zero, but this epsilon zero depends on the particular direction that you choose. So this set of perturbation, it's a smaller set of perturbation than an open dense set, but uh, this is a, a set of perturbation for which we can prove that there is diffusion. Yes. Is O I or all this good? So um, yes, so they are disjoint or sufficiently small. So uh, I mean, if they are not disjoint, still you can do it. So, but the interesting case is that when they are disjoint. Oh. <coughs> okay. In this form, it's yours. So so well. No, this is the this is your result. So, what I want to uh, say so, uh, what is the geometric? What are the geometric objects? So the uh, geometric objects. Uh, so I mean, uh, this is uh, something that uh, Jean Pierre uh, talked about. Uh, uh, on Monday, so the resonances are the ones that organize the dynamics, and uh, it's important to distinguish between uh, simple resonances and double resonances. But among the double resonances, you discriminate between uh, some uh, double resonances that are weak and some others that are strong. And at the end of the day, you try to follow these resonances to hit your targets. And the construction that you get, you get as uh, Jean-Pierre Marco explained, uh, it's you obtain a sequence of cylinders. So these are uh, three-dimensional cylinders. So again, these cylinders are in the So these are in the energy manifold. Um, each uh, cylinder is uh, normally hyperbolic. So they are actually normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds uh, with boundary. And uh, so they have stable and unstable manifolds. So uh, what you get is you get that for the same cylinder, you, ca you have homoclinic excursions from the cylinder to itself. So you have that the stable and unstable manifolds of each CK uh, intersect transversally. And, uh, but you also are able to travel from one cylinder to, uh, to uh, the next via heteroclinic excursion. So you have CK plus 1 intersect uh, CK plus 1. So this happens for all the cylinders in the chain. And um, what 
else. So um, remember that the objective is to visit uh, each of these open sets. So how do you uh, make sure that you visit these open sets? So when you construct this uh, chain of cylinder, you, const uh, uh, you construct with a property that for each uh, open set OI, there exists some k and a cylinder, and there exists a, uh, an essential torus. So this is going to be a uh, two-dimensional torus contained in the three-dimensional cylinder uh, such that, so this is in some cylinder CK, such that uh, T intersect is not empty. So uh, let me draw a picture associated uh, to, to this narrative. So essentially, you have cylinders and uh, on on each cylinder you have You have um, uh, homoclinic excursions, and the homoclinic excursions are encoded uh, by the scattering map. You also have uh, heteroclinic jumps from one cylinder to the next. And um, so what are you uh, also trying to achieve is that whenever you have an essential <coughs> torus containing uh, one of the cylinders, and an essential torus would be uh, homotopic to the boundary of the cylinder, there is an orbit that goes uh, uh, delta close to, to each such a torus. So you give yourself a delta. Uh, a distance by which you want to shadow uh, each essential torus in the sequence of cylinders. So uh, in these uh, cylinders, uh, uh, some cylinders are uh, along this, uh, you follow the simple resonances, but some of these cylinders uh, happen at the double resonances, so they are referred in uh, Jean-Pierre's work as singular cylinders, and the singular cylinder is essentially a cylinder from which you cut off a disk, and the remaining part of the cylinder is uh, invariant for the uh, flow restricted to the cylinder. So in this picture, some of the cylinders are singular, and for, for this uh, geometric approach, uh, it doesn't matter the way you travel along the ceiling, singular cylinders. You do the same type of uh, transition or diffusion as for regular ones. So some cylinders are, are singular. Um, all right. So, um, so what I want to say is that um, maybe one of the uh, benefits of this uh, a method in which you use the inner dynamic uh, uh, quite a lot, so you iterate, the, you follow the inner dynamics as much as you can, is that exactly that you can pretty much uh, shadow each essential torus that uh, appears in the inner dynamics. So this is, let's just say, a uh, weak form of uh, topological transitivity. So of course that one of the questions uh, about the Arnold diffusion is to prove that they are diffusing orbits, but uh, other people are asking other type of questions, and one of the questions is whether you have uh, transitivity, whether you have a robust transitivity. So there is a work uh, 
among other people of uh, Nasiri and Pujals, who are asking whether you have uh, robust transitivity generically in uh, nearly integrable Hamiltonian systems. So this is not the answer to that question, but it's, let's just say, something that gets a little bit close to that. So um, so what I'm going so the, the main theorem is the following is well, let me put here uh, the most important uh, uh, item in this construction is that uh, there are additional properties which uh, I'm going to reveal them at the right time. So for now, keep in mind that there should be some additional property that you need to use, but uh, it will make it difficult to uh, explain them uh, right now. So the theorem is that uh, given a sequence uh, as above, so this is a finite sequence uh, of cylinders, and um, uh, delta greater than 0, so there exists an orbit Um, such that uh, it, it gets that gets delta close to uh, every essential torus. OK, so uh, this is a uh, result about uh, the existence of orbits for the Hamiltonian flow that uh, follow the cylinders and uh, get delta close to any in, uh, essential torus which is part of one of these cylinders. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, sketch the proof So uh, to sketch the proof, so uh, what you do is that uh, these cylinders have some nice properties that uh, enter in this item. So one of them is that uh, for each cylinder, there is a, a global surface of section. So I mean, so this is for the flow reduced to, to the cylinder. And um, this, so in this way, you reduce your problem to two-dimensional dynamics. Of course, there is two-dimensional dynamics restricted uh, to um, uh, these sections. So these sections are like annuli. And uh, inside the annulus, you have the return map from each annulus to itself. So you there is a because this is a, a global surface of section for the for the flow restricted to the annulus. There is a global surface of section, and what you get out of the context of this theorem is that. Each of these is a monotone twist map. And of course, area preserving. And 
So this is uh, the reduced dynamics to the surface of section for each of these cylinders. And uh, you also get outer dynamics, and you get outer dynamics when you follow the homoclinic excursion, and you also get outer dynamics when you follow the heteroclinic excursions. So uh, there exists, uh, let's say, uh, scattering maps that uh, go from one of these annulus to, to the next annulus. So um, and uh, there also exist uh, homoclinic maps from each annulus to itself. So when I'm going to write psi k, I actually mean a family, a possibly infinite family of homoclinic maps that goes from an annulus to itself. So, but I'm going to use this uh, shorthand notation. So these are uh, homoclinic maps. So at the end of the day, so these are all scattering maps. So it's exactly what was uh, showed in every single talk up to now, so the scattering map. <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to uh, emphasize that uh, one of them is from uh, the annulus to itself, and the other one is from one annulus to the next. But the idea is exactly the same. You go up on the unstable fiber up to, uh, to an intersection, and you go down uh, along the stable fiber, and this is the map. So, um, and let's see uh, what else. Um, and additional properties. So of course, there, there are some additional properties hidden here. And all I'm doing right now is that uh, translate into some additional properties that are hidden at the next level. So um, what is the picture? So the picture is. So this is a finite collection of uh, annuli. And um, essentially, what you want to do is start at the bottom of the first annulus and move up. And when you try to move up, you are going to use uh, both dynamics, the scattering maps and the inner dynamics, the twist maps. Uh, when you, you arrive at the top, you are going to use uh, uh, the heteroclinic map in order to jump to the next one. So uh, you are going to end up at the bottom of the next one. So top and bottom means in terms of uh, uh, this is some system of action angle coordinates that you, you put canonically on this uh, annuli. And you go up again, and so on. OK, so, so this is the strategy. So what you produce, you first produce, produce pseudo orbits that follow the system of the poly system of using either the twist map or the scattering maps in uh, any order it's more convenient for you. Once you produce, uh, I mean, of course, that what you want, you want an additional properties from these pseudo orbits that for each gamma, which is uh, an essential circle. So whenever I have an essential circle, uh, in uh, one of these analyzes, so an essential circle, it's something that it's 
uh, homotopically non-trivial relative to the annulus. So this is like a, a Lipschitz graph provided by the uh, Birkhoff theory. Uh, there is a point on this orbit Uh, that is delta close uh, to t. Uh, so uh, once you achieve this objective, so you constructed a pseudo orbit, which uh, gamma. Uh, gamma, thank you. And uh, then at the end of the day, uh, you want to produce a, a true orbit, and a true orbit comes from the uh, shadowing lemma type of argument. As in uh, I mean, this argument has to be uh, uh, tweaked a little bit uh, for the following reason. So here you have uh, these uh, scattering maps that take care of the homoclinic excursions, but uh, when you go to the uh, maps, so these are uh, scattering maps for the flow, so you want to translate this into uh, maps corresponding to the uh, discretization. So uh, the picture, it's I would say uh, not surprising. So imagine that uh, this is one of the cylinders, and you have uh, the familiar picture for the scattering map. So this is the scattering map. When you so uh, relative to a choice of the homoclinic intersection, uh, you. Uh, assigned to the foot point of the stable fiber, the foot point of the unstable fiber. And uh, then uh, when you put the section, so let me choose the section to intersect the uh, image, the range of the scattering map. So this is sigma k. So I'm going to draw another copy of uh, this section. So what you have to do is uh, you have to flow from the section to the location where the scattering map for the flow is defined, and follow the scattering map, and uh, then repeat. So this uh, creates, let's say, some uh, minor nuisance in the process. But so uh, the base, the most difficult, uh, I mean, the most difficult part is really to move uh, from uh, the bottom of uh, annulus to the top of the annulus. And once you do that, uh, the heteroclinic jumps from one annulus to the next are uh, relatively mild. So let me try to explain a proposition that uh, <coughs> describes how to achieve these jumps. I mean, uh, not the jumps. So I'm going to uh, fix uh, one of these annuli, and on this annulus, uh, we have uh, the twist map, and we have the uh, scattering, the family of scattering maps, the homoclinic maps. So this is not one, but many. So uh, I'm going to draw it here. So let's say that uh, I want to uh, describe a little bit more careful uh, the boundaries of, uh, of this annulus. So this is one of them, and this is the other. So I have two uh, invariant circles that uh, uh, bound the, uh, the annulus. So this is the sigma. 
So, um, there exists a uh, <coughs> pseudo-orbit of the system phi and m psi uh, of the following form. So, z n plus 1 is uh, so you apply uh, the inner map for a large number of times and then you apply one of these a choice of one of these scattering maps and uh, the first point is in some uh, neighborhood of the lower boundary circle. The last point, so this is again a finite. So the last one is in a neighborhood of uh, the top one. So basically, you start here, and uh, you end up here. And uh, if you have Some and there exists an the for each gamma, which is an essential circle for F, there is the N delta close to gamma. Okay? I build a pseudo orbit uh, that goes from the a neighborhood of the uh, lower boundary to a neighborhood of the upper boundary and gets delta close. So delta was uh, fixed at the beginning of the game. So delta close to each essential torus in uh, essential circle in between. Once you have. Yes, yes. You apply the inner dynamics as much as you can. Yes, so this is uh, the inner dynamics that you, I the idea is that you apply the inner dynamics quite a lot. So you control very well the inner dynamics. Uh, uh, huh? No, 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 no. So this is an existential type of result okay, okay. Uh, in the sense that uh, you cannot really control, but on the other hand, it's algorithmic in the sense that uh, you can follow a recipe, and if you are lucky, uh, you are going to get. Uh, uh, your pseudo orbit, and then there is a true orbit. But how, how you choose the inner dynamics until you get to gamma? So That's what I'm going to explain. So, um, I mean, getting getting close to gamma is is uh, actually you, you fix yourself a delta, which is uh, chosen at the beginning of the game. So the point is not that you have to get uh, close to gamma, but it's like imagine that you don't want to miss any delta wide strip. So mo this is more or less the objective. So if you, uh, in principle, if you would be able to uh, cut your uh, annulus into uh, strips that are uh, delta wide in some sense, and if you visit each of these strips, you are going to be delta close to each, sing every single uh, invar essential circle in between. So this is like an informal way of explaining the process. So uh, now uh, let me say <coughs> that uh, some, of these some of these additional properties, so I'm going to explain them in this context. So there are additional properties on the inner dynamics, and there are additional properties on the outer dynamics. So for the inner dynamics, so let's say for phi, you assume that uh, for each essential circle, the uh, rotation number is uh, irrational. And um, let me, so this is one of the uh, key properties uh, that uh, we are going to need. And the immediate consequence of this is that whenever uh, you have two distinct essential circles, they are never going to intersect. So if they are not the same, 
they are disjoint. OK? Uh, there are uh, other properties uh, that uh, I'm just going to say, but uh, uh, not uh, right, is that uh, you want this uh, uh, upper and lower boundary to be dynamically minimal, and you also want them to be limits of essential circles that are dynamically minimal as well. So these are some technical requirements. So uh, for Psi. So uh, you don't actually need uh, that much. I mean, because it would yes. suffice uh, that, there is, uh, that there is one essential circle with the rational rotation number. So which, uh, it needs delta x3 or something like this. Right? Yeah, uh, but I think, uh, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is this has been proven by Hermann to be a generic situation yeah, that you can destroy. True. Yes. So uh, the more interesting. Oh, so there is another uh, consequence. So so a very important consequence for us is uh, besides that the uh, essential circles uh, never intersect uh, one another is that each essential circle. So if gamma is an essential circle, it's either the uh, boundary of a Birkhoff zone of instability, or is accumulated, or its limit of essential circles. So uh, let me draw a tiny picture about this. So essentially, uh, well, what is a, a boundary, is a Birkhoff zone of instability? So, Birkhoff zone of instability is a region bounded by two essential circles so that there is no essential circle in between. So, so either you have, let's say, gamma is the upper bound of uh, Birkhoff zone of instability. Or if it fails to be the upper bound, then gamma is going to be accumulated from below, but by other essential circles. And the same t uh, statement holds for lower bounds of Birkhoff zone of instability, and in which case you have accumulation from above. OK, so what are the properties for the um, Outer dynamics. For psi, so this is an additional requirement for psi. So the additional requirement for psi is that uh, let me draw it first. So is that uh, for each essential circle. There is uh, an arc which is, uh, so this is going to be called <coughs> a splitting arc that for which there exists a, a scattering map that uh, takes, so the arc is zeta, and the image of the scattering map applied to zeta is a piece of this essential circle. So for each gamma, there exists a zeta arc that is below gamma. And uh, there is also in one of these uh, scattering maps such that a psi i of zeta is containing gamma. So now for the for these splitting guards, uh, there are some technicalities. You can uh, describe, uh, let's say, three types of splitting arcs. So uh, this is a right splitting arc. This is a left splitting arc. And there is, let's say, a vertical splitting arc. So a right splitting arc simply means that if you look at the base point, you can always find 
points on this arc that are arbitrarily close to the base point that are always on the right. So arbitrarily close, you move to this, you find points for which the projection into the uh, angle variable falls to the right of the uh, base point of this arc. Left splitting arc is the same. So, and a vertical is the only other possibility. There is, if it's not a left splitting arc and not a right splitting arc, the only way uh, this can happen is that some piece of the arc is actually vertical. But the problem is that uh, this doesn't, ca doesn't matter for us because you iterate this guy. And when you iterate it, it becomes uh, one of them. So when you take a vertical line and you apply the twist map, it becomes uh, a left splitting arc, essentially. So this is, so. Um, so you don't kind of have kind of oscillation? If, if there are oscillation, I mean, yes. I mean, this is not uh, either or. So uh, one arc can be a left splitting arc and a right splitting arc in the same time. And this is fine, so. So uh, what is, um, let me focus on the right splitting arcs. And uh, then for the right splitting arcs, you have the following picture. So for a right splitting arc, uh, so let, let me say that this is my arc. So this is the end of the arc. So what I'm always able to uh, draw is a domain associated to this arc. So the domain is the following. So you draw a vertical line that is on the uh, right side of the base point. You choose the tallest point on this arc. And then uh, the domain of the splitting arc is made by this piece of uh, the arc. So you follow the arc up to the highest intersection with the vertical line. Then you follow the vertical line. And then you add this piece of gamma. OK? So what is the objective? Uh, the objective is that, uh, let me say it in words first. So uh, you, you start uh, with a neighborhood of the lower circle. And you use the inner dynamics uh, as much as you can. When you cannot, it means that there is an essential circle that is an obstacle for the inner dynamics. And this, uh, for each of these obstacle, there is a splitting arc. And what you are trying to do in that case is hit the splitting arc. And if you are going to hit the splitting arc, so if I'm able to hit the splitting arc, there is a whole neighborhood that is moved across this essential circle. And you end up with a little bump above this essential circle. And you can use this little bump to uh, repeat the uh, construction, which means that uh, you iterate this by the inner dynamics as much as you can and, and until you encounter an essential circle and repeat. And the way to uh, hit this arc is actually you try to get inside this domain. So, um, so the, the argument has exactly two parts. So, so the construction is, one step of the construction is you apply, let's just say, let me uh, be a little bit more general. So uh, start with uh, an essential circle gamma uh, and u a, or let me call it gamma 0. And you a neighborhood of a point in gamma 0. So uh, the Birkhoff procedure, it means that uh, you iterate this uh, infinitely many times in the future. So this becomes. So this appears in the, uh, in the work of Birchhoff to prove that there is always a point that starts near the lower boundary of a Birchhoff zone of instability and goes to the 
hyperboundary of the Birkhoff zone of instability. So essentially, you iterate. Uh, when you iterate uh, infinitely many times, you get some holes. And then you fill up the holes. And when you fill up the holes, you get uh, uh, another essential circle at the top of, uh, of this process. So uh, now you are trying to repeat the procedure. And the way to, to repeat the procedure is use a splitting arc to move from below this essential circle to above this essential circle. So uh, let me take, uh, so the first step is the Birkhoff procedure. So you start with a circle and either a neighborhood of a point on that circle or uh, it can be a neighborhood of the whole circle. And uh, you produce uh, another circle at the end of this procedure. So of course, that if you want to repeat this, you want to create another uh, neighborhood of a point associated to the circle that you just produced. So, uh, and uh, two situations can happen. So uh, one situation is that gamma 1 is the boundary of the Birkhoff zone of instability. So now you are really starting to exploit uh, these uh, assumptions of the uh, inner dynamics that can be your gamma 1 can either be the upper boundary of a Birkhoff zone of instability or, or the other choices that is accumulated from below. So case 1. So this is gamma 1. Uh, this is uh, gamma 0. This is uh, your uh, neighborhood uh, u0. And I'm not claiming that the whole region is a Birkhoff zone of instability. But I'm claiming that somewhere below gamma 1, there is a Birkhoff zone of instability that separates gamma 1 for something else. So uh, what you do is that um, you know that there is a, a splitting arc here. And uh, imagine that this is a right splitting arc. So I'm just going to assume this for now, uh, that the twist is a uh, right twist. So I'm just going to use this assumption for uh, this piece of the argument. So if this happens, um, I should draw this a little more convincing. So this is the domain which is associated by the uh, uh, right arc. And uh, there is an argument a la Birkhoff that tells you that uh, there is an orbit of the inner map that uh, starts from here and ends up inside the domain. So uh, if you choose this neighborhood a little bit careful, so for example, you can choose this neighborhood to, uh, to be essentially like a bunch of uh, vertical lines. So um, there is a vertical line that goes from this point to the essential circle on the bottom. And when you iterate the vertical line by the twist map, you get a so-called uh, negatively tilted, tilted curve. So what is the negatively tilted curve? So this is your point. So this is the starting point. This is the arrival point. And a negatively tilted curve uh, looks something like that. So it only tilts whatever uh, clockwise. So essentially, you say that uh, I'm going to start at the bottom and uh, follow uh, the tangent direction along the curve. And if I define the angle in a continuous fashion, the angle is always positive. So you cannot, so it cannot do this. So it rolls in one direction. It can unroll, but it cannot unroll more than it rolled. So because 
this is a vertical line and the image of each vertical line is a positive, it's a tilted curve like that. This uh, image wants to get inside here, so it cannot get inside this piece of the boundary of the domain. So this is a no. So the only way it can do it, it can go by crossing the arc. In the moment that it crosses the arc, there is a small neighborhood of this point that reaches this arc. And the image of this arc by the scattering map gives you a little bump. So this little bump, so you obtain a whole neighborhood u1, which is contained in some psi i and m1 uh, u0, I don't know, something like this. And then you repeat. So the other possibility in this uh, construction is that, so let me just draw it because I'm kind of running out of time. So the other possibility is that uh, this uh, circle that you produced by the Birkhoff procedure is not the uh, upper boundary of a Birkhoff zone of instability, but it's accumulated from below. And this is, uh, so case two, it's actually easier. So I'm going to do a proof by picture only. So you have a bunch of circles uh, that accumulate to gamma 1. So uh, imagine that this is your splitting arc. So because these circles accumulate onto gamma 1, you choose uh, circles that are uh, sufficiently close. <laughs> so when you start with your neighborhood u0, when you iterate it, because uh, of the Birkhoff procedure, uh, you are going to fill up uh, the space up to gamma 1, so which means that uh, phi, let's say, m0 of u0 is going to cross a bunch, bunch of these circles. But now these circles have uh, different rotations numbers, so when you start to iterate this more, this intersect this arc. And once it intersect this arc, you are in a good shape because uh, you go up. <coughs> what Will remark is that you can take this M0 as large as you want, right? Uh, you can take uh, this as large as you want. That, that is correct. Yes, and this is important. So uh, the other uh, thing is that you have to ensure that uh, through this procedure, you go from the uh, bottom of the annulus to the top of the annulus. So how can this not happen? This cannot happen if you somehow accumulate in between. So if these circles start to accumulate in between, if this repeated Birkhoff procedure gives you some, some, uh, something that uh, it's in between and it doesn't reach the top, then you'd have a problem. But essentially, this argument over here tells you that this cannot happen, OK? So let me just uh, take uh, another uh, 60 seconds, maybe, to explain some, something that is quite interesting. So uh, what happens if uh, you have a twist that is this way to the right? And the splitting arc is in the other direction. So the twist is this way. And you have a splitting arc that is in the wrong way. So you cannot apply this procedure anymore. right? So this procedure, it's really if the orientations of these guys uh, match. So uh, what you do, uh, you use the inverse dynamics which is illegal. So you apply the inverse of the scattering map to, uh, so the inverse of the scattering map applied to this, it's uh, 
tilt uh, arc in the other way. I'm always getting confused, positive, negative, right, left, and so on. So you get uh, the same thing. So what you obtain, you obtain a fake pseudo orbit. So this is so you take uh, so you sort of ignore that uh, this is a fake dynamics that it's illegal to use. You use it anyway, and what you obtain you obtain a fake pseudo orbit of the system that involve uh, both the positive and the negative iteration of this. But then the bottom line is that uh, you can prove quite easily that that if you take a finite pseudo orbits of the legal system <laughs> and finite pseudo orbits of the fake system this is dense so you can approximate every orbit of uh, the fake system by a orbit of the correct system and uh, the this follows uh, by Poincaré recurrence because if this is psi and you have another segment of an orbit using using the uh, uh, fake dynamics, you can uh, put here a very long segment of the correct dynamics to kill the effect of that. So in this way, you are sort of using only the positive iterates to get from one point to another. So this is all, and thank you for your attention. And sorry for taking extra time from me.